Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we're doing quantity theory of money and looking at some money demand functions. We'll also be looking at the linkage between money growth and inflation. So we know that central bank changes our monetary base through open market operations, that is sale and purchase of securities. So monetary base is currency plus reserves. And once it has changed the monetary base, it will end up changing our monetary aggregates like M1, M2, etc. But how do changes in your money growth rate affect changes in your price level or cause inflation? So today we'll be exploring the linkage between these two. Let's look at some data. In this panel, I have average money growth rate by decade, all the way from 1870s to 2010s, and also the corresponding inflation rate, the average inflation rate for each of these decades. Now you can see for decades in which we had very high inflation rates, specifically your 1940s, 1910s, and 1970s, also have correspondingly very high money growth rates. As a general trend, we see whenever we have a lower money growth rate, the inflation rate also tends to go down. This data was for United States. If we do a cross-country comparison, we see a similar trend. So now we have the average money growth rate from 2006 to 2016 and the average inflation rate over the same time period. Again, you see economies which had very high money growth rates also ended up with very high inflation. Note that this data is averaging over a 10-year period, so it's our long-term data. We can easily conclude that we cannot have high sustained inflation without high money growth rates. So money growth rate is the driving engine behind inflation, at least in the long run. This gives us a very strong policy implication for monetary policy makers that in order to avoid high sustained inflation, they must be watching our money growth rates. Velocity of money is simply the number of times a dollar changes hands. We can use a very simple example to understand what do we mean by velocity. In this simple economy, I have four students. Student one has $100, so that's the total stock of money we have in this economy. None of these other students have any money. However, they do have some goods or services that they are willing to exchange. Student number two has two tickets to a game worth $50 each. Third student has a calculator worth $100. And the fourth student has 25 pence, which are worth $4 each. Next, let's introduce some transactions in this economy. My first transaction, student one is buying the calculator, which is worth $100. Second transaction, now because student 3 has $100, he can buy the two football tickets. So assuming he spends all of those $100 on those tickets, he goes from student 3 to student 2. He can now spend the money on buying the 25 pence. Third transaction is here. Student 2 buying the 25 pence. Given this total stock of money as $100, let's calculate the total value of transactions. Is my total value of transactions also equal to the $100 that I have? It's actually a lot more. Note that the first $100 were spent on the calculator. Second transaction, the $100 were spent in buying the two tickets. And in the third transaction, the money was spent in buying the 25 pence. And overall value of transaction is a lot higher than the quantity of money we have in our economy. In this very simple economy, how many times did money change hands? If you note, we have a total number of transactions only as three. It gives you your velocity of money in this example as three. Velocity, remember, is the average number of times a dollar changes hands. I can rewrite velocity as a formal definition. It's the dollar value of your transactions divided by the number of dollars. If I use my previous example, the dollar value of our transactions was $300. And the number of dollars or the stock of money we had was 100. And that gives you again a velocity of three, which is exactly equal to the number of transactions that we had in our economy or the number of times each dollar changed hands. P times Y is your value of transactions. In our aggregate form, we have Y as real GDP, P as your price level, and the amount of money or the stock of money we had is your money supply. That in our case was 100. Note that for the same economy, if we had not stopped after the third transaction, so if we had more number of transactions, velocity of money would have been higher. The more frequently each dollar is used, higher is the velocity of money. So for economy with the same level of money stock, but with a higher velocity could end up with a higher value of transactions. So total value of transactions will increase, higher is your velocity. And vice versa, with the same stock of money, if my velocity is going down, so the average number of times each dollar is being used is now less, my overall value of transactions will go down. I can rewrite this equation in terms of value of transactions equaling my 
quantity of money stock m times velocity and this is remember velocity of money also remember that your value of transactions is simply what we call our nominal gdp where pre is your aggregate price level and real gdp is your aggregate real output produced so we can simplify the equation as money times its velocity will always equal nominal gdp when we rewrite a velocity equation in this format we call it our equation of exchange now this equation of exchange is simply telling you that the value of transactions will always equal our quantity of money times its velocity and we can also quickly check this with our earlier example note that my total value of transactions or nominal gdp in my initial example was coming out to be $300 and i can also now check for my left hand side money stock in the economy was $100 and the average number of times our dollar bill changed hand was 3 and you can see our equation of exchange holds now i can now rewrite my equation of exchange in its dynamic form remember the math rule that a percentage change of a product is simply the sum of the percentage change of each of these variables Taking percentage changes on both sides, I get the dynamic form of my equation of exchange. The positive relationship that we see over here uh, between money growth and inflation is not enough unless we talk a bit more about velocity. Now, what is velocity? The classical perspective coming from Irving Fisher and Milton Friedman is that velocity is pretty much constant. Why? Because the classical economists believe that velocity depends on your underlying institutions. And it takes many years for technological innovation and financial innovation to take place and for velocity to thereby change. Thereby sticking to this classical perspective, we'll assume velocity to be constant for now. And if the percentage change in velocity is zero or it's quite stable, it will have a huge impact on our equation of exchange. And we are left with money growth rate equates your inflation rate and your real GDP growth rate. With velocity as constant, we have now arrived at our quantity theory of money. Now, why is this a quantity theory of money? Because this is now showing you a very significant positive relationship between money growth and inflation level. Higher the money growth rate, higher will be the inflation level. Rearranging the equation to solve for inflation, we see that the inflation rate will be negatively impacted by the growth rate in real GDP. So an economy which has very high money growth rate but is also experiencing real growth will overall have a lower inflation rate. The policy implication over here is very strong that your policymakers should keep the money growth rate always equal to the desired level of inflation and the real growth rate. And secondly, the importance of the real growth. If an economy is experiencing real growth, it will have a lower level of inflation despite high money growth rate. Classical economists also have another very strong assumption and that is about flexibility of wages and prices. If wages and prices are fully flexible, output is always at its full employment level. So real GDP is not going to change. Now if real GDP is not changing, my second term over here is also zero. And you're simply left with a very strong direct linkage between money growth rate and inflation rate. For policymakers, the implication is that in order to control inflation, we must limit our money growth rate. So economies like Turkey, Venezuela, Russia, which have very high inflation rate in the last 10 years, must limit their money growth rate in order to control their respective inflation rates. Quantity theory of money just doesn't give us the relationship between money growth and inflation. It also gives us the money demand curve. So rewriting our quantity theory of money with velocity is constant. I can now solve for M. Dividing both sides of the equation by velocity, I end up with my money stock as 1 over V times PY. Now 1 over V, remember, is a constant. Why? Because if velocity is constant, the inverse of that will also be some constant k. Replacing my constant k in this equation and assuming at equilibrium money demand equals money supply, I can write my money demand function as constant k times my nominal GDP. This money demand function is immediately telling us that higher the nominal GDP or higher the value of transactions, higher will be our money demand. So people primarily hold money in order to undertake different type of transactions. We need cash in order to purchase different type of goods and services. This money demand can also be looked at in terms of demand for real money balances. In that case, I'll be looking at M over P. That again is giving me a very strong relationship between real money demand balances and real GDP. Higher the real GDP of our economy, higher will be the demand for real money balances. Another thing to note over here is that this money demand coming from our quantity theory of money 
does not depend upon interest rates. Interest rates have no role playing in this money demand function. Now do not forget that this money demand function and the quantity theory of money both rely on the fact that velocity is assumed to be constant. Next we'll look at actual data to see how velocity actually behaves. So in these two panels, I have time series data for velocity. In the first one, I have long term data. So this is from all the way from 1959 to 2013. And we're looking at the long run velocity of M2. And in the second panel, we have quarterly data for velocity of M2. The shaded regions in the second panel are depicting our major recessions or slowdowns in the economy. In the first panel, note that until 98, there is a trend in rising velocity and after that it starts to fall. However, over this full time period, the net effect is only a moderate decline in velocity of about an annual rate of 0.3%. Taken as a whole, this historical data is pretty consistent with our classical assumption or Fisher's assumption that velocity is quite stable or constant. So if velocity is relatively stable, does not fluctuate that much in the long run, it means that inflation can be controlled by controlling the money growth rate. However, in the second panel where I have quarterly data, you can see velocity of M2 is quite volatile. The scale of the figure is running from negative 12 to positive 8%. So these are huge upheavals in our velocity in our quarterly data set. Notice that the velocity is quite high in the 70s and 80s. This was a period when nominal interest rates peaked at about 20%. Such high interest rates did two main things. Firstly, a high interest rate means that the opportunity cost of holding money is very high. So people would not want to hold that much money and convert their cash into alternative assets which are giving them much higher return. In this period, we also saw a lot of financial innovation. People were allowed to hold stocks and bonds on which they could also write checks, so giving them some much needed liquidity. And recall, given our definition of velocity, with the same level of transactions, if people are holding less money, velocity of money is actually increasing, which is what we are seeing in the 1970s and 80s. In contrast, note that since the 1990s, velocity is going down, and so is the nominal interest rate in our economy. Along with that, we have financial innovations that are slashing the cost of holding money. So they're not offering us as high returns as they initially were, therefore causing velocity of M2 to also fall. Now data in the second panel is creating a lot of problems for quantity theory of money. If velocity is not constant and in fact it fluctuates with interest rates, we cannot use control of monetary growth rates in order to control inflation. So let's move on to our next theory which will help us explain why velocity fluctuates the way it is and what can be an alternative policy instrument for monetary policy makers.